Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, welcome to the Larry Charles dangerous world of comedy in times of coronavirus. Hello, Larry. I think you have to unmute yourself, which is on the on the left side. On the left Second. side down. Perfect. Yeah, now I'm now I'm unmuted. Yes, <laughs> welcome to the show. Yes, sir. It's a very <laughs> dangerous thing for me to be unmuted, so we'll see what happens. Let's see. So, uh, dear audience, I'm really glad that uh, we are continuing as every day with DMs TV, the world after coronavirus, or as me and Larry Charles were joking the other day, uh, we should have called it the light at the middle of the tunnel. Uh, because as the famous German playwright Bertolt Brecht said, uh, will there be singing in the dark times? Yes, there will be singing about the dark times. Uh, we are perhaps in the dark times, uh, but there is no, there is no better person than you uh, to tell us why jokes, humor, uh, why they are so much of importance like in the moment like today. Perhaps we start from that question and... Well, f first of all, my, my first thought as you were saying that is, when have there been light times? That's a hard one. I, I look at civilization, the history of civilization, and I am hard pressed to think of a really light time. Uh, even when you think of uh, eras that are often characterized as being positive, like the Renaissance or post-World War II America, there were always oppressed people, there were always people suffering, there were always people sick and poor, living in poverty, not taken care of. There was always a power gap, a power in inequity. So, you know, I think we are in another dark time as humans are often plunging themselves into often uh, dark times that we could have done something about and didn't. And, uh, and here we are, it's another dark time. And there is a, uh, it's, it's a natural human antidote to bleakness. It is a way to survive bleakness. It's as important in my view as water or food. If you lose your sense of humor, you lose your humanity and you lose your ability to feel compassion towards others. So um, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's part of the continuum of our suffering. Great, so let, let me start uh, by a joke. But by the way, I'm a very bad joke teller, uh, 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 but I oh, can my. try. Okay. Uh, it, it, I mean, it's, uh, now it will be an even more terrible joke once you announce that it will be <laughs> terrible. But anyhow, it comes from Zagreb, Croatia. Uh, this Sunday, uh, uh, Zagreb uh, was already like many cities in the world, uh, basically almost the majority of cities. As far as I heard, two billion people as of this moment are in one way or the other in confinement, which means isolation, self-isolation or quarantine. And Zagreb and Croatia as well. Uh, so on Sunday, something tragic happened. It could have been even worse, but... Uh, the worst uh, earthquake in more than 100 years hit Zagreb. Uh, just at the moment where people uh, from day to day, they were informed and requested by the authorities to stay at home. And they wake up at six o'clock in the morning, there is an earthquake uh, 5.3 or something. So it's not um, a naive earthquake. And suddenly the authorities are sending the messages, hurry, go out to the streets but keep social distance. <laughs> that was, this is this kind of complex situation where we are yes. in. And then my good friend from Bosnia, uh, Jelena made a joke saying that, imagine that you are watching a movie about uh, global pandemics and then an earthquake hits. Uh, you know, it, it would get the poorest ratings ever in, in, in history. <laughs> and what's happening in Zagreb, what happened, you had an Pandemic, you have a global pandemic and then an earthquake hits. And then people of Zagreb, they were, as you said uh, at the beginning, they were actually uh, of the same importance as food and water was the jokes. So immediately yes, yes. organized a virtual, uh, virtual waiting for the Godzilla. Uh, like saying, okay, an earthquake happened, virus happened, maybe also yeah. Godzilla will come. Uh, I was just saying to my wife this morning that it's very much like a, a monster movie 
in the sense that the first two acts of the movie, the monster does a lot of damage. And then about two thirds of the way through the movie, the scientists figure out, oh, wait, here's the weakness. Godzilla doesn't like electricity or whatever it is. And then the, the rest of the movie, the last act of the movie is figuring out how to uh, attack the monster's weakness and destroy it. So that's very true. But also you talk about earthquakes following pandemics. We have, maybe we were lulled into a sense of complacency that things were gonna be okay, that we have some control over our environment and over our destiny. And then these things come in waves that we have no control of. And it humbles us as humans to realize no, there are no guarantees. You can have a pandemic and an earthquake happening at the same time, and it doesn't mean something else won't happen. That is, again, that sense of bleakness and hopelessness is buffered by humor, you know? That's where humor steps in. When you start to see that large reality and it's overwhelming, your, your humorous perception of that will help you figure out your way through it. Uh you know what you are talking about, uh, uh, of course. Uh, me and many of my friends, we were addicted to Seinfeld uh, in the 90s after the collapse of Yugoslavia. When I was a kid, we were watching Seinfeld. That, that, that was much better than Baywatch. Uh, <laughs> nothing bad about our friends right, and, uh, right. and so on. But uh, in a way, when I look into retrospective, it is interesting that Seinfeld touched and also curb your enthusiasm, uh, touched some of the most interesting phenomenons of the coronavirus crisis. Uh, one of them is hand washing, uh, and the other one is toilet paper. Uh, yes. So the first one is, I remember still this episode with Jerry uh, Seinfeld, who is on the toilet, and then uh, there comes a man inside, pieces as the men usually do without washing the hands, uh, go into the red, Jerry returns to the restaurant and then comes the waiter offering a pizza and Jerry is, I cannot eat this pizza because he remembers that the pants yes. were sore. And there is also another episode uh, where uh, Jerry, George and Kramer uh, talk about hands when Kramer appears and he has this kind of electric hand, if you remember. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So well, you, 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 I, I was going to say that uh, you could do a great supercut of like Seinfeld during a pandemic because Larry, Larry David and Jerry were both very germaphobic people long before it became trendy. So um, that's why there's so many toilet paper stories and hand washing stories and cleanliness stories and hygiene stories. Um, but it'd be funny to take those elements that you're describing and sort of put that together with some sort of pandemic movie trailer. I think that would actually work well together. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the other famous episode is the one, uh, what's the name? Uh, no, what's, what was the name again? I don't know the name of, aha, uh, I don't have a square to spare. Right, uh, right. That famous episode, I mean, there are a few, uh, but there is yeah. one episode where Elaine actually steals all the toilet paper. Yes, that's, that's one that I wrote, actually. And uh, really? yeah, the, the idea that someone wouldn't share their toilet paper with you s struck me as a funny idea, but people are very possessive of their toilet paper as you see what's going on here in the supermarkets, you know? How do you explain this? I mean, everywhere in the world, toilet paper is the most precious commodity, obviously. Is it because people shit a lot or they copy paste the other people or is it so precious? How do you explain it? Well, you're tapping into something very interesting. In my travels, uh, like the travels that I did for Dangerous Comedy, I came to realize that paper is a precious commodity in most of the world. You know, you might go to a hotel in certain places and they give you a, a, a Kleenex, a tissue, and that's supposed to be your napkin, your toilet paper, it's supposed to serve all your purposes. So we in America, again, have become very spoiled and very complacent because you can go to the supermarket and there's 42 different brands of toilet paper and they're all comfortable and soft and they have lotion if you want it, whatever you want, but we take it for granted what it takes to get that toilet paper up our asses, you know? And I think once we start to realize that, maybe things like this are gonna make us be more aware of how we use things and how we waste things, then maybe that will change also. And then that Seinfeld episode will become kind of a quaint artifact, 
of a previous time, you know. Yeah, I mean, uh, what it shows at the same time, I would say, is, you know, this unstopless uh, consumerism, you know, uh, also this panic at the supermarket. Uh, yes, yes. The way I was also I was also reminded of, you know, you remember when there was, you know, something about Venezuela or some Latin American country, usually socialist country, Cuba, and there are right. always the, the photos of empty supermarkets, you know, ah, this is a proof that socialism yeah. doesn't work. Uh, but what about capitalism? You know, there are so many empty shelves. How cannot capitalism produce enough toilet paper? I mean, this is... And where comes this human desire for toilet paper? That's also a question. In a time where, obviously, this is not our biggest problem today, toilet paper. Yeah. Or it, it, it becomes a metaphor, doesn't it? I mean, we are... It, it's, it's almost like we are trying to protect our asses, you know? We're so scared, we're scared at, you know, our asses are our most vulnerable place in a way. And so everybody sort of like retreats to that primal fear and maybe it sort of, uh, it, it kind of, uh, it comes to life. It's embodied by this toilet paper uh, hoarding and, and fear of not being able to wipe your ass, you know, somehow or another, even though people, Toilet paper, by the way, as you probably know, and I, I just recently have been you know, researching it, it's a relatively recent phenomena. For most of civilization, people did not use toilet paper, and yet people today can't imagine living without it. So uh, it's interesting, because who knows, we may have to live without it again someday in the future. Well, many, yeah, but many parts of, of, of the world live without it, actually, and they, are, they maybe have even more hygiene than, than the Western world, you know? Uh, 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 yes, because Americans are lazy, and so they use the toilet paper instead of the hard work of cleaning your ass, you know. <laughs> when, I, when I listen to you, it's impossible not to, uh, to, to remind myself of another philosopher, uh, but who obviously didn't appreciate Seinfeld so much as I do. Uh, this is the French philosopher Jacques Derrida. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> yes, he had an this. issue. He had an issue, I mean, he obviously didn't watch it and he didn't understand it, but maybe just to explain it for the audience, uh, because I sent you the clip a few months ago, uh, in 2000... Yes, yes. Yeah, so in 2002, uh, the French philosopher Jacques Derrida is asked by a journalist, uh, so what do you think about sitcoms and do you think that Seinfeld is a sort of deconstruction? Uh, Jacques, good old Jacques, was really. Oh, I have you frozen for a moment. I don't know. Yes, what... you're fr you're frozen too. Should we do anything about that? Maybe we stay like that. I don't know. Let me just. Uh, I I think now it's fine. You see, okay, this great, is the great. ghost. The ghost of Jacques Derrida came and wanted yes, to. Yes, he intruded upon us. So I see that. <laughs> Awful. So anyhow, he said, uh, if you want to do deconstruction, uh, which meant which meant uh, I. Uh, I, I won't explain what the construction means <laughs> by reading Derrida. Uh, he said, don't watch sitcom, uh, read books and do your homework. Uh, I mean, I can tell you what I felt when I saw that. I was really disappointed in Jack Derrida because what yeah. I found also in one hand washing scene of Seinfeld uh, was precisely a sort of deconstruction. This is that scene with Kramer, George and uh, Jerry. Uh, where Jerry is talking about his hands and then he has a self-ironic comment how these are not manual hands, you know, these are not working hands. So, and that's what I like to cycle. You were always deconstructing. Absolutely. I, I, yeah. You would think that that would be Dorita's favorite TV show because it is all about deconstructing every aspect of itself from the structure of the show the structure of sitcoms that we've gotten used to, it's we're, we're deconstructing that paradigm to begin with. The characters themselves are self-aware and self-conscious in a way that you have not really seen characters in a show like that be commenting on themselves in a sense. And then you also have the dialogue, the language itself is constantly being torn apart and put back together again in different ways and experimenting with language. So it seems very much in keeping with deconstructionism. Yeah, thanks a lot. I think uh, uh, 18 years after that event, this is a good revenge to Jacques Derrida. I hope he will not throw <laughs> us again. <laughs> <laughs> we'll uh, see, we'll see.
Yeah, but to come to one, uh, we, 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 we talked about Seinfeld a lot, but to come to your most recent project, uh, which is the danger, Dangerous, Larry Charles, Dangerous, dangerous what's happening with my tongue? Dangerous world <laughs> it's okay. of, of comedy. comedy. Yes, yes. Uh, in relation to the current coronavirus crisis, so you traveled to really dangerous places, such as Somalia. Uh, I have a friend who is from there, and he tells me that it's pretty fucking dangerous to travel there and you also explained how many preparations you needed to do and so on yes, and in yes. most of the places which you visited you know the war-torn countries all across the globe uh, you dis discovered jokes even dark humor and how people are coping with the situation uh, compared to these places which you have visited and seen uh, and having the coronavirus crisis in front of our eyes uh, how do you see it? Is it an unprecedented historic event? Uh, do you think, uh, did you see any jokes coming already? Is it possible to joke? Because we can also see that with the state of exception, which I think is a, also a dangerous trend, uh, there might be some censorship as well, because you cannot really joke about everything. Yes, yes. Uh, well, let me, let me back up just a little bit, because um, one of the things that really struck me in my travels, a couple of things. One is, I had to get all those vaccines to go to all those countries. So here I was going to Liberia, going to Somalia, going to countries like that. And I, you know, I didn't get a cold or anything. I was okay here back in my house in Los Angeles. This is where I may wind up catching something and, and, and having it kill me. But also more importantly, um, Liberia, I was in Liberia in the post Ebola period and what all the comedians and actors and cultural people that I met there told me was that the comedy industry, such as it is in Liberia, was born out of the Ebola crisis. So there at their nadir, at their nadir as a society with the Ebola crisis wiping them out, humor was one of the, uh, um, one of the masts to the sinking ship that people held onto. It was like a lifeboat that people crawled onto and discovered humor, discovered their, the humor that was inside of them when they were faced with this bleak future. And the humor industry in Liberia really was born out of that. Everybody I met before, before the Ebola crisis, they were just sort of trying to get by. And after, they started picking up their cell phones and their iPhones and their little cameras and started shooting videos and started using social media to talk to each other. And it really, it really became a, a, a lifeboat for the society. So it, it, it can't be underestimated, the power of humor, the power, and that's one of the things I think is Trump. Trump has really uh, squandered an opportunity to uh, be honest with people and still make them feel all right. I mean, it, it, you know, when you think about someone like Obama in this crisis, I mean, we, we, we need uh, uh, someone, if someone's gonna stand there and be a leader, you need someone who is going to be able to speak to the public, not look down at some piece of paper and read it like he's in second grade, but somebody who can talk from the heart, which again, Trump clearly cannot do. He, he, he has never once shown the least bit of compassion for all the suffering in the world or in the country here. So that's a part of the lack of humor, you know? With compassion comes an ability to smile at things that and see the duality of things the horror and the humor they are entwined they can't be separated and here right now uh, uh the leader of the country is not providing that pathway for people to to operate so everybody's bottled up in their house in their emotions they're not you know thank goodness we have the satirists you know who are operating out of their houses to me that's one of the coolest developments they're still bringing us the truth from their houses and being funny about it. So those guys are kind of like the heroes right now, as far as I'm concerned, here in this country. I'll just uh, uh, get some questions uh, from, from the YouTube chat and then yes. we continue the conversation. Uh, sure. One is, maybe you already answered, but let's, uh, let, let's pose it and you'll see. Uh, so, it's it's a good question with a with a statement at the beginning. It says capitalism is fundamentally boring. Uh, should post capitalism put humor at the center of its philosophical project? 
<laughs> well, you know, you, the good thing about humor and about comedy, as I've discovered, and it's taken me a lifetime to discover this, is it transcends political systems, ideologies, economy. You know, there is comedy everywhere in the world, from the poorest countries to the wealthiest countries. So humor, humor really sort of transcends all these limitations, and that's what makes it so universal. There is another question asking, uh, what are some of the most ridiculous, absurd things you have seen happen in the coronavirus crisis? Well, There's I would tell so you the, many of them, I know, but <laughs> yeah, the one that pops into my head because it's a daily event is the Trump news conference. The Trump, the daily Trump press briefings are like uh, a, a three stooges in a pandemic. You know, it's like it's frighteningly inept. It's it's sociopathic. It's weirdly awkward. It's it's everything it's not supposed to be to the point that it, it, it crosses the line into absurdity, even though and, and the absurdity is underlined by all this. All this is going on while people are dying. So to me, the Trump press briefings are probably the weirdest strangest we've come to accept it and normalize it but if you listen to what he says and you listen to the way he says it you even look at his presentation this it, it is absolutely mind-bending that he is in charge of anything and so the daily exposure to that is almost like watching some kind of apocalyptic sitcom <clears throat> that's actually i mean when I stopped worrying, to paraphrase uh, uh, Kubrick, and started to love coronavirus, I hope I will not get <laughs> for this joke. Yeah, this joke uh, was the moment uh, when I realized that uh, coronavirus is really unmasking uh, those populist leaders who were bullshitting so often. Uh, like Trump is one of them. Uh, the other one is certainly Bolsonaro of Brazil. Yes, uh, yes. Then another one is Vucic uh, in Serbia, who was at the beginning at the press conference, similar to Trump and Bolsonaro, saying, "Oh, this is nothing. This is not. This is just like a flu. Not even more dangerous, and so on." And then at one point, he even suggested to the Serbian people to drink rakia. Uh, which we in the Balkans really love to do, which is a great alcohol, strong alcohol. Uh, but can you imagine, you know, a leader in this kind of health crisis suggesting this? Uh, but I would say there is a good outcome out of it that perhaps more than ever, people are finally starting to listen to scientists, to doctors. Uh, those people are more and more in the media. As much the media itself is complicit in the populist rise, I would say. At the same time, I think there is a small shift uh, towards more attention because now everyone feels that our lives are in danger and if you listen to donald trump bolsonaro victor orban for instance you might end up without your life you know how yes. do you see this do you see the coronavirus crisis as an opportunity for more emancipatory politics i, I absolutely do i i completely agree but uh, uh, just to add humor to this conversation the polls today in America show that Trump has actually gone up. His popularity has gone up. So you have this kind of, um, you have this further fissure in the society here between the people who are craving the truth, craving reality, craving science, craving medicine, and people who are craving magic. You can never underestimate the amount of people who want to believe in magic, whether it's Jesus, whether it's the resurrection and Easter, that Easter, he's combining Easter and the end of this disease, by the way, that's not an accident. You know, that Jesus resurrection trip is, is very much tied to, to that date, you know, and he wants to tap into people's fears and anxieties and false hopes. And to me, that's what that's all about. You know, it's like, there is that, there are people as you described, like you and I, and most people that we probably know and hang out with, who are seeking the answers here, seeking the truth here, and reaching out and feeling the suffering. And then there are people who just want to believe in magic and hope that Trump is the magician that's going to fix it just like he promised. Mm. Or Bolsonaro, or Orban, or whoever it is that is making these crazy, completely illogical promises that people are still willing to believe. 
that that's the frightening part man people it's it's these people are saying it on stages in front of microphones in front of millions of people but there are also millions of people who are completely buying it that's the frightening part yeah speaking about frightening stuff so no joke coming <laughs> uh it, i i think your point is really good uh, because um, it actually points into the uh, into the importance of magic uh, esoteric thinking uh, uh you know and it reminded me of a really brilliant book i mean it's huge uh by uh, a guy called eric kurlander a historian uh from the united states who wrote a book about uh, the third reich and occultism uh, the third reich and border signs and everything what existed even before the rise of nazism you know during the weimar republic but also earlier during the austro-hungarian monarchy uh, there That's was a trend that after the first world war you know when so many people came back many people died you had the spanish flu in 1918 so you had a major crisis in the world and most of the people were retreating, well, maybe not so much to humor, but to this kind of magical thinking, uh, yes. you know, Donald Trump, who has his uh, uh, spiritual advisor and so on. That was the same as in the times of Hitler, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it's a very good point you made to, to point in that direction. And there comes a question which is connected to this, because you and me here can joke until the end of our lives here and stay forever here. <laughs> but the question is, how do we change the world? So there is a question, which I think is a very good question. How can we make humor in this time of crisis accessible, unifying in a way, and can we make it classless? I think uh, I think it already is. You see, I think it already is. Uh, uh, humor is a classless uh, act. Uh, humor transcends, as I was saying before, to me, it transcends all barriers. The issue is that capitalism is the kind of system that needs to possess, it needs to own, it needs to commodify. So uh, the Western, um, the Western commodified system has taken comedy and made it into a product that then can be sold very successfully around the world. But comedy doesn't need capitalism. Capitalism needs comedy because it's a, it's a profitable product. But comedy will survive long after capitalism uh, disappears. Great. There is also a question which brings us more into daily US politics. I mean, you already mentioned uh, Donald Trump and uh, that actually he is rising uh, uh you know the polls as more as more stupid he is the more the polls are rising obviously yeah, yes but there is a question what does larry charles think about uh, the cooperation between the dnc establishment and the media attacking uh, bernie sanders um well if you followed my tweets or instagram i am absolutely disgusted by the DNC's behavior towards Bernie Sanders as well. Bernie Sanders has clearly been thwarted by his own party once again. Um, the pandemic aside, there was a, a, a desperate need on the part of the Democratic Party, the Democratic establishment, the Democratic donors who really drive that to not allow Bernie Sanders to be the candidate. That was very, very clear when you looked at the coverage, when you looked at not just the amount of coverage, but even the way the, the narratives were framed so that Bernie Sanders was some sort of rabble rouser rather than a U.S. senator and congressman for 40 years. You know, um, he was he, he and he was not able to control that narrative because it was bigger than he was. It was bigger than the Bernie bros. It was bigger than all the people that wanted that progressive change. Uh, there was enough fear in the, in the Democrats and coupling that with the Democratic donors to uh, uh, create an atmosphere in which he could not succeed. And that's where we're at. Now you have Joe Biden, you have Trump every day on TV, sort of, and this is why I think his ratings are going up, He's on TV every day, whether he's stupid or not, he's there for two hours, whether you want it or not, on every channel. Meanwhile, Joe Biden is doing what we're doing. You know, he's on social media right now going, hey, I'm still here. You know, so that's the difference also in the uh, in the way the media and the, and the Democrats, too, have handled this. The Democrats have not been skillful in in fighting back against this thing. 
you know? I mean, Schumer, to his credit, they passed this thing today and it looks like they have done what they can to stop the corporations and the Trump family from profiting from this bailout, but they haven't done enough to go to the American public and say, this is why we need to change. You know, that's very important. Yeah, unfortunately, this is the case also all over Europe, where I think the last years were pretty miserable for the left. Uh, but what I find interesting uh, is, uh, you know, there haven't been many victories, I would say, for the left. True. A lot of defeats. Uh, uh, but what I find interesting uh, is how the coronavirus crisis uh, suddenly makes everything seem possible. You know, I woke up this morning, uh, Britney Spears is talking about wealth distribution and, and the general strike. <laughs> Did you see that? This that was... is that is comedy in the time of coronavirus. That, there's your definition of it. Britney Spears is now a socialist, you know. Yeah, this or uh, another moment which goes a bit more deeper into the political economy. Uh, of our current moment and global capitalism. You remember when uh, Jeremy Corbyn and Labour were running for elections sure. unsuccessfully, uh, and they were also advocating the nas nationalization of the railways in the UK. Coronavirus comes, uh, Boris Johnson announcing to nationalize the railways. Of course, it's not the same program, of course. Right, right, but still. Uh, but still, you can see that some things can be done and that's something what the establishment was claiming that it is socialist, radical and so on. I mean, see Trump and experimenting with a sort of universal basic income. A few weeks ago, that was only Andrew Young. Uh, no one right, asked right. about it. Now, suddenly, what seems impossible is becoming possible. So my question is, do you think... Uh, there is hope in this that, uh, you know, we might use this moment and not only Trump, who is every day on television and live and rising the polls. Can we use it? How can we use it? I, I absolutely believe I, I have a certain uh, innate optimism that people can seize these sort of black swans and turn them into something very positive in our society and in our civilization. My fear is that as long as Trump and people like that are sort of uh, giving lip service to some of these things, some of these massive changes in the society, that people will become complacent again and go, okay, Trump, Orban, Bolsonaro, we don't wanna really change this. We just wanna fix things for now. And then you have Boris Johnson and Trump and those people, they're gonna to wanna to bring it back to the way it was as quickly as possible. And they will have the money behind them to do that. So I think what's important is that what the changes that get instituted remain, sustain, you know, that we, we approach life in a fundamentally different way with a fundamentally different perception. That would be an optimistic scenario because it might lead to very positive changes in the society. But my fear is that people are not willing to do the hard work. They are willing to accept magic rather than reality, even though you and I can tell the difference. A lot of people can't. And, and my fear is that once this is done, we will have human amnesia and return to the way it was as quickly as possible, forget as quickly as possible, only to face something worse the next time. How's that for humor? <laughs> that was that was very hopeful. <laughs> no, so, sometimes sometimes I think you know if this thing suddenly stops, uh, which most likely it won't. So don't have any hope. I think it will last for uh, months, year or two. But imagine it suddenly stops before summer. I think what would happen is most of the people would finally say, "Oh, finally I can you know have some rest of coronavirus." If they're happy enough that they are left with any savings uh, uh, and that they still have some future. And then the establishment during summer will do the best to use the situation and, you know, to return things to normal. Uh, but uh, there are more questions in the chat. Okay. But this is a semi-democratic space. People can post questions in the chat. I can see them, curate them. And there are really right. plenty, plenty of questions, good questions. Uh, one is, uh, is there a danger of too much humor making people take things less seriously? Like for instance, policies that affect their lives. 
yes, I think there is a danger in that. And, I, and again, I've seen that in America and I've seen it in other countries. There are two kinds of humor, the humor that makes you want to forget and the humor that makes you want to remember. I think those are sort of two distinct worlds of humor. And there is humor used in a lot of societies, you know, even in fascistic societies and totalitarian societies, humor is used to placate the masses. Uh, so there is that danger at all times. Who is speaking? How much freedom do they have? How much censorship exists in the culture will dictate how, how dominant and predominant that humor is, how prominent that humor is. But in a society like America still, and even in a lot of places around the world, uh, the voice of dissent, the voice of humorous comedic dissent is still also very strong. And, also, and look, we have Zelensky in Guatemala, we have a comedian who is president. People also think of comedians as truth tellers. And when they finally get sick of the bullshit, they turn to somebody they think is telling the truth. And comedians are people you could trust to tell you the truth. That, does that mean you are nomin you are a nominee, a potential nominee for the for the next elections? Or uh, I would say that I would do a very very good job. I because I, I, I think I care about the right things, and I think that it's not just me. I think a lot of people would do much better in that position. Uh, you would too. I think there are people who have a, you know who look around and want to make things better and want to make people suffer less. Somebody like Michael Moore, for instance, to me, he's like an American saint. His only goal is to uh, uh, alleviate suffering. And yet at the same time, he's uh, reviled for that by a large segment of the society. And that's, that's the, the, the dichotomy that we haven't resolved. Yeah, I watched his speech. When was it? A few weeks ago uh, during a big event for, for Bernie. And that was just amazing. I mean, the kind yeah. of energy he had, honesty but also anger and humor at the same time. I'm very ready All those, to Exactly. He has a very, he has a very, like Larry David, they both, and not me necessarily, but those two have a way of taking the darkest themes and finding a lightness in their, in their discussion of it so that they can take very, very dark, tragic, non-comedic ideas and they express it in a way that becomes very palatable. It is really a skill that those two men happen to have. Well, they are not here, you are here, and I think you are also <laughs> very skillful in a different way. And so I want to pose you a question. I, I guess most of the audience who watches us today uh, know that uh, you were one of the creators of Kramer in Seinfeld, right? I'm not, not a, well, not, I should, let me clarify all of that a little bit. Please. Kramer, Kramer was, there was a real character named Kramer and he was Larry David's next door neighbor. Um, and so when they decided, when Jerry and Larry decided to do the show, that Kramer character, the next door neighbor was gonna be a character. Larry did not wanna call him Kramer because he didn't wanna get involved with a real person and all that, you know, the trouble that would cause. But Jerry insisted they finally called him Kramer. Then they had to audition. They auditioned a lot of people and they and finally Michael Richards came in and Michael Richards got the part and he really the, the things that people love about Kramer are really Michael Richards. What I did was that that character was very underutilized at the beginning of the show. He would literally come into the apartment, do a scene and leave and that was it. And I was looking for a way in, you know, Jerry and George they were really covered very well by Larry and Jerry. And I was looking for a way into the show and Kramer was somebody I related to and I knew the real Kramer. And so I began to write scripts that incorporated, that, that expanded Kramer and incorporated him more into the, uh, the actual uh, organic system of the show. And, um, and that's what I contributed to the Kramer character was expanding him so that he, we, we learned about him, we see what his philosophy is, we see what his belief system is, we see his delusions, and, and that's what I think I contributed to Kramer was I gave him kind of a subtext, you know? This is, this is brilliant because you just made your life harder uh, because <laughs> you made this beautiful introduction. So I wanted to ask you, uh, how would, you know, if we put Kramer into the coronavirus crisis, uh, what would be the philosophy of Kramer? How would Kramer react to the coronavirus? Could you perhaps imagine it? 
He knew it was coming all along. And he had, he's been hoarding for years. And if you finally go into his apartment, you will see it is stacked with boxes of stuff. So he's ready. He's got the bunker already in that apartment. Yeah, that's true. Because I remember one episode of Seinfeld where you have Kramer on the street, there is the car, and then Jerry comes and asks, what, what is all this stuff? And Kramer was just panic buying, which was what, 30 years ago? Yes, he was a survivor. He's, he's the original survivalist. Yeah. And another character you, you, you are connected to uh, is, of course, Borat. Uh, what, yeah. would Borat what would Borat do in, in this kind of situation of coronavirus crisis? I think Borat would, would be oblivious to it. And I think he'd be kissing people and touching things and uh, horrifying people on the street uh, by, by not believing, you know, I think, you know, don't forget uh, the religion in Kazakhstan and Borat, they believed in the hawk. So they were very magical thinkers, you know? So he would probably blame the Jews and think it was a hoax and be touching everything and horrifying people by, by infecting them. He would actually destroy civilization himself, probably. In the, in the, that would be this, the science fiction Borat would be that he'd be so oblivious that he winds up infecting everybody and everybody dies. <laughs> so Borat would be the best friend of coronavirus, something like yes, that. Yes, exactly. He would work Borat, together. Yes, exactly. He would welcome it. He would, but he's not scared of it. I think that's the key to Borat. He would not be scared of it. And he would be think he would think it's ridiculous that you're scared of it. So he'd want to kiss you on the lips to show you how absurd it is. <laughs> don't, don't do that. Yeah, social yeah. distancing. Social distancing. Exactly. He would be the uh, the least socially distant person you could imagine. <laughs> there is another question uh, from our audience uh, asking. Uh, I think it's a good political point. What do you think about the function of humorous? memes during crisis and tragic events. So a question about memes, how do you look at them? I, I love that there are so many different mediums now. When I was first starting out, there were, there were no outlets uh, for ideas, for jokes, for a, a person who had no connections to show business to be able to express themselves. There was no social media, obviously. Um, so I, I love, I, I see a lot of creativity in all these different platforms. And I love, I love the different mediums and memes are a fantastic medium. I see, I try to do them myself. I'm not as good as some of the people who really specialize in them, but I'm very inspired by them, I would say. Absolutely, they're visual, they are very impactful. They are like great billboards for your mind, you know? Sorry, I, I was. Uh, there is a question uh, which is connected to the movie business. Uh, obviously, comes from a professional or from the audience who love watching movies. It is uh, what times, what types of films, short videos, and series should we be producing uh, in the times of coronavirus crisis, according to you? Well, I think you know you were talking before about uh, uh, some of the positive changes that might come out of this, and one of the positive changes that I've seen is um, the stripping away of a lot of the artifice in TV. For instance, we realize you don't need a whole set for a news for a news show. You know, you exactly or this. You know, so right. This is this is fine. This is good. This is real and. You're going to see, I think, more of that stripped away, which I, I very much support. The stripping away of all artifice. It's really unnecessary. It costs a lot of money. And this is a way for the people to sort of be able to communicate. Uh, look, most of the stuff on the news in America, they're, they're culling footage from people's Twitter feeds and Instagram accounts because they don't have the money to send camera crews out anymore. So it's already there. And this might be the last push to strip away a lot of that uh, artifice from nonfiction television, whether it be news, journalism, opinion shows, reality shows, anything like that. Um, they don't need all of the uh, trappings that we've gotten used to. And I think people immediately adjusted to that because they really already had by being involved in social media. Mm -hmm. I, I think the origin of, of this show, I mean, we call it a show, but it was really just a crazy idea at the beginning, which you joined and we just made a recording with Noam Chomsky. Uh, and then at the end, you will love it actually, at the end, 
I'm sorry, I'm, I'm famous as, as the biggest spoil machine, so I'm going to spoil the Chomsky video. At the end, you hear a dog barking and constantly a parrot talking something. I didn't even know <laughs> that, that mom has a parrot and a dog. And he says, I ask, so what is the parrot saying? And the parrot is saying sovereignty to the people in Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> language. And that's what I like. I mean, it kind of proves your point. You know, this apartment here, it's not my apartment. I'm here only because of the coronavirus crisis. I don't leave the apartment much. Some people complain that this plant looks really bad, but I must say that I'm watering it enough. <laughs> so, that's very nice of you. But that's yeah, good. but it shows that you can today you can do meaningful programs uh, which people watch all across the world you don't need high quality and so on uh, i think the yeah. content is becoming much more important than than the well, we, what you're what you're providing with this is an, is urgency and uh and and truth and honesty and also humor you're providing a, an experience which the news generally doesn't do that's why i say people like trevor noah and Stephen Colbert and Seth Meyer and Bill Maher and, and John Oliver, they're providing what, what we're trying to do here, a full range of information, uh, 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 you know, educated opinion, humor, and connection with the audience. You know? And I think that's, a, that's just a fantastic thing. And that is what's going to hold us together uh, through this, to some degree, is the ability to connect, to know that you're not alone, even if you're stuck in your house. You know? Uh, there comes a question uh, from a great Greek comedian called Spiros, uh, who poses the question, uh, the right brought humor back to politics. Did the left learn to meme yet? <laughs> I see great, I, 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 I follow a number of leftist memes on Twitter. So it's, it's all out there. Every opinion you could possibly have is represented now in humor, you know, from the farest far right humor to the farest far left humor. And if you are not looking for it, you might not know it's there, but it's there. So every possible point of view is represented by comedy, which is one of the things that makes it such a healthy, uh, uh, a healthy force in the society because it, it, it's, it's, it's fed, it's strengthened by plurality, you know? Yeah, we're, we are slowly coming to the end, although it's, it's a democratic format, so we can go to the toilet, come back in half an hour, and everyone will wait. I hope good, you have good. toilet paper. I have it if you need some. You're hoarding. Good, good. Yeah. <laughs> How quickly can you get it here? Yeah, but so, so since we are yeah, coming to the end or not, uh, let's see. I wanted to pose you a personal question. Uh, so... You are also obviously in self-isolation. The situation is pretty serious. Uh, today, Spain uh, had uh, a bigger death toll than China. Uh, so yes. many people are locked down. Populist reader, uh, leaders are using the situation already. Uh, how are you coping with it? Uh, and also, what are you doing at home? How does your time, your day look like at home? Do you like it to be in self-isolation or not? Well, as I've been saying to most people, I'm, I'm, uh, I've been in self-isolation for years. So uh, like Kramer, I, uh, I've been sort of, uh, I'm a, you know, I used to just be called antisocial. Now it's self-isolation or self-quarantining. So my wife and I are already kind of fairly isolated. I also live in a fairly isolated place. So in that respect, in both of those respects, I'm pretty lucky. You know, I'm not living in the middle of New York City and people don't realize that New York City is larger, the population is larger than 39 states in America. So it only makes sense that it would have that many more cases. But I live in a fairly isolated part of Los Angeles. And so it's, re it's been relatively easy so far. And my wife and I also have, over the course of the months, because of the wildfires and earthquakes, we have slowly been accumulating stuff anyway. We've had to evacuate. You know, again, I went to uh, Africa. I went to all these countries in Africa and I had no problems at all. And since I've been back home, I've had to evacuate my house and self-quarantine. So I've had both extremes, you know, right here in Los Angeles. So I, I, I feel very lucky that we're in that situation, you know. Also, as my wife has pointed out to me, I took 
as did all my small crew, we took the malaria drugs when we went to Africa. And so who knows if uh, uh, that's helping me also, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, again, it seems to now the disease is sort of moving from older people with underlying conditions to everybody. But, you know, again, every day that I feel okay, I feel lucky basically. And so far, you know, we're doing okay. And because we are basically homebodies, we're really doing a lot of the same stuff we would normally do, you know? We're, you know, we're, we're watching TV, we're working, I'm writing, I'm about to launch a YouTube channel. I'm trying to be creative and fertile and, you know, do, uh, uh, you know, be productive and be useful to the society in some way. So we're, we're both, we're all finding our, our way to do that here, which is good. And again, very lucky to be able to even contemplate that kind of thought. Yes, I, I think that's a really good point because, you know, since the crisis started, uh, so many governments are saying you have to self-isolate, uh, be at home, possibly if you think that you are infected, be in your own room and so right. on. But I, I, I feel that for the majority of the world population, this is just impossible because capitalism and neoliberalism destroyed housing. They destroyed the possibility exactly. for people to be at home, at the, yes. they destroyed homes. Uh, so this, I mean, I, you can very often when you just read the ideology behind this kind of terms, self-isolation, social distancing, and so on, uh, you will find more problems than answers actually to the current crisis. That's, so well, I also well, feel very privileged, even in this little studio, uh, to be here and to, you know, to have the opportunity to talk to you, to have the opportunity to create social bonds on the internet at this moment. It's a privilege, and uh, I'm really happy for it. You know, <laughs> I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but no, you know, something that is uh, uh, that that really moved me. What you just said, uh, because uh, we've talked uh, uh, through texts and Twitter for a couple of years, and to to see you, see your mouth moving, see the sounds coming out, hearing it, talking back, having a face to face conversation with you, and and having it be this easy, and having it be in the midst of all this chaos. I'm very grateful also, and I, and I thank you so much for inviting me to do this, uh, not just to be able to talk about all the stuff, but to be able to hang out with you in person for a little while. That's been, that's been great fun, man. Thank you. No, come on. Thank, thank you for joining. You, you made my day. Uh, oh, you me. <laughs> no, to be completely honest, maybe this might be comforting for some people who watch us, like, I don't know, on Sunday there was the earthquake in Zagreb. Uh, I felt utterly helpless. Uh, what can I do? I'm not in Croatia at the moment. I cannot come, borders are closed. Family is there, father is 71, with heart issue, diabetes, so he's the risk group and so on. And to be honest, you know, this thing that we can hang together and also other people and uh, share thoughts, but also organize, uh, this gives me a reason to wake up. Because otherwise I was waking up already every day and then each day you get the messages which are every day worse and worse and worse. And suddenly I even had a feeling that everything stopped. Even my psychological life went into a kind of PTSD. You know, you already... Right. Yes. But there is an earthquake. Now, after a pandemic, what is next? You know, everyone is yes. in this kind of... And I think we need this kind of spaces, definitely. Yeah, it's to, you know, again, uh, uh, I, I hear what you're saying. I mean, we get help, we feel helpless, we feel hopeless, we feel overwhelmed, and we're looking for something to bring us back to reality. Let us land in reality in the present moment where we do have a little bit of control over it because the rest of it is pretty much out of control, but we can control our moments as best we can. We can make our choices. We can stay connected, you know, and push through and, and, you know, look, you are, it, it, it bothers me to hear you uh, uh, feeling so bleak because when I think about you, I think about your book, you know, Poetry for the Future. And that's who you are. You're a person who believes in poetry for the future. What is that gonna be? You're asking questions about the future. You know what I mean? It reminds me of like Stanley Kubrick, who you mentioned before, he had told people when he made The Shining that it was an optimistic movie. And people said to him, how could you say The Shining is an optimistic movie? He said, because the premise is that there are ghosts. There is something after death. And that's an optimistic scenario. Even though it's a horror movie, the idea that there is something after death to me is very optimistic. So 
I, I see you as a very a, a darkly optimistic person. And uh, so you must hang on. <laughs> Don't <laughs> let go. I'm counting on you. No, no. I, I didn't say that I will now make a suicide or a harakiri or something. But uh, I just wanted to share. Yeah, I, that's how I see you as well, to yeah. be honest. No, so, it's, uh, it's hard. It's very, very hard. I mean, my parents have both died recently. And I spoke to my brother and we both said, you know, like in some weird, sick way, it, we were grateful that they had died before, you know, being in nursing homes, we wouldn't be able to see them, you know, they would die alone like that. You know, it was just a terrible thought. And yet, you know, I hate the idea of having to be glad that my parents are dead you know, to, to have escaped further suffering, you know? That's the kind of stuff that we're thinking about that we never thought about before, you know? Yeah, this point just made me even more worried because, you know, my father and also older people and so on, basically, if this crisis goes even deeper and harder, you, you know, you, you might have the Italian scenario, uh, funerals uh, are canceled. Yes. Yes. Then visit uh, the person who is sick and so on. That's, so in that way, yes. I understand you in a way. I know that it feels yeah. kind of, you feel glad, but in one way, maybe it's better not to see this completely mad world. Although, to be honest, my father doesn't care. He, I called him the other day and he says, <laughs> I, I can hear he's on the street. I'm like, okay, where are you on the street? <laughs> where are you going? To the supermarket. Like that, no, this is the only thing you shouldn't be doing, you know, go to the supermarket. But there is something with old people, they just don't listen. And I think the reason is because they survived so much and they're probably fed up yes. with people telling them what to do. I think, I don't know how to interpret that. Well, you're now tapping into something else very deep, but I don't, I don't know if we even have time. This may be a, another discussion to have somewhere else, but you're tapping into our perception of death you know, how we face it. Someone like your dad, or even my dad, who were, who were soldiers, who were in World War II, my father was in World War II. You know, I mean, he's, he, you know, his, his family was in the Holocaust and wiped out by the Holocaust. So they've seen a lot of shit in their lives, a lot of bad things. And maybe at a certain point, you reach that level where you know that you're gonna die. You know that there's an ending, you know, and, and we, especially in America, our, the American ego does not really acknowledge death, you know? Um, we, it's, it's kind of like there's gonna, be, there's gonna be a way out, you know? And I think it's, this is gonna force people to be more honest with themselves about their anxieties about death, which are very understandable, about their philosophy of death and, and uh, you know, accepting the fact that there is an end to human life. We're all in our apocalypse at all times you know, and life will end for everyone at some point, like it has for everyone before us, the powerful and the weak, the same life ends. And so if we somehow figure out a way like the Buddhists have done, or like your dad has done, perhaps, who they've kind of figured out their philosophy as they go forward, then maybe that's a positive change in the society, because that would also have positive consequences, potentially also, you know. I, I completely agree. I mean, there is uh, this famous essay by Michel Montaigne, uh, where he talks about the habit, the tradition among the Egyptians that, you know, during a, uh, a big dinner, during that time, they would always come with a skull. And, you know, that, that was the origin of the memento mori, you know, in the sense yeah. that the best time of your life, remember that you are mortal, mortal. And unfortunately, I think Trump and all these guys didn't realize that yet, you know, they, yes. they, they are immortal. Uh, but yeah. Uh, well, we they, may be, they may be the last, someone like Trump, who's never really had any adversity, you know, he may be amongst the last people to be able to labor under the delusion that they're immortal, you know? The concept of immortality may find, you know, talking about deconstruction, the concept of immortality, which we've carried with us from the beginning of time, may finally be fragmented and, and uh, demythologized uh, properly, which is maybe what we need to go forward into a more realistic and better future also. Yeah. 
Larry, thanks a lot. Uh, we are coming to an end. Uh, I have to announce uh, before I give you a moment for a final message uh, or a yes. joke or, or something well, depressing, whatever you prefer. <laughs> <laughs> or all three. Uh, everything at the same time. You have a minute yes, to think yeah, about yeah. it. Uh, let me just announce uh, tomorrow's event. Uh, unfortunately, today, uh, the lawyers of Julian Assange didn't succeed to uh, get bail and to get him out of uh, Belmarsh prison, uh, where he's kept uh, after already seven years in arbitrary detention. And uh, the UK court uh, rejected it, uh, although there are huge fears that there is a big risk of him getting coronavirus and he already has a chronic uh, lung uh, disease. Hmm condition. So tomorrow we will have as our guest John Shipton, the father of Julian, uh, and I invite you all to join. Uh, this program is completely free, uh, brought to you by DM25. So if you want to support us, uh, go to our page, donate some money or just register for the next events uh, already for tomorrow, but also for the other events by using the registration. You can already pose a question uh, or send a suggestion for the next speakers. I very much hope that Larry will join us next week or soon and that we will hang out again. So Larry, anytime, thanks a lot. Anytime you want, uh, be my pleasure. It was my honor, uh, it, was, it was fun. And um, again, I, I thank you so much. I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity. I'm grateful to you. And maybe it's time for an episode of the Netflix series you did. And we are much looking forward to your YouTube channel. Please let us know once it is online so we can join. I will keep you posted. Thank you so much. All right, then. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks a lot. See you next time.